Hello, good morning everyone. Before we begin, let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Juan Manuel Gorriz. Um, I am a food professor at the University of Granada in Spain. Today, I'm going to be talking about our latest work in the field of machine learning and its application to neuroimaging entitled a hypothesis driven method based on machine learning for neuroimaging data analysis. Well, uh, before we move on, I would like to thank Professor Thang uh, for his invitation to join the ICMT meeting. And I also want to thank the DASI Institute at the University of Granada, the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, and the IBS in Granada for supporting my research. Um, well, uh, this is the summary of my presentation. First, uh, I will go on a brief introduction to the field and a brief story of the application of machine learning to neuroscience. Then I will describe several methodologies in this context, from the imagined datasets to the assumptions and ubiquitous models employed for neuroimaging data analysis. In this section, I'll continue by giving the complete connection between the GLM and, the, and its statistical framework with the statistical inference by machine learning. Then I'll show some experimental results using synthetic and real data. An example, the uh, any that set. And finally, I'll draw some conclusions and ident identify the main challenges for future words at the end of the presentation. In the last decades, neuroscience has transitioned from reports of case studies to population studies. In this scenario, we, we usually utilize classical statistics, but it is only re relatively recently that statistical learning methods, including machine learning, enjoy increasing popularity in this field. Despite the culture collision that happened from that moment on, there's a shift from data models to model-free approaches for neuroimaging data analysis that is improving our understanding of the human brain function. I recommend you to read this uh, paper by Leo Brayman, Statistical Modeling the Two Cultures, that all the, these uh, issues are uh, discussed uh, in depth. So go in and uh, enjoy the reading. The first use of machine learning uh, methods in neuroimaging date from the early 90s. In this paper by Grady et al, they employ principal component analysis to classify subgroups in Alzheimer's disease. In the beginning of the 21st century, this method became popular after renaming them as mind reading, brain decoding, or multivariate pattern analysis. Well, as a footnote, I would like to say that we started our research in 2006 with a project entitled uh, DEN Classes that stands for Neurological Disease Detection Based on Signal Classification and Blind Source Separation. However, there remains an open question about the usefulness and interpretation of machine learning methods in neuroimaging, where they are applied to a simple methods for solving binary classification problems. We will explore the complete connection between the GLM, the general linear model, that is commonly used in the neuroimaging field, and machine learning regressions, and derive a refined test within the SPM framework. We call it support vector regression in the inverse GLM. More details about the algorithm, uh, about the proposed methodology, are in the paper referenced at the, at the bottom of the slide. Before we start with the methodologies, in this slide, I'll give you a clear motivation on why we work in this field. A simple search on Google with uh, the, uh, the keyword false positive neuroscience reveals that hundreds of papers and references in this field may be wrong. Certainly, this is the main goal of our project entitled The Alienist uh, that will be presented in the ERC uh, Advanced Grand Call in the current year. We 
Well, in this work, um, in other papers uh, published by my group in, the, in recent years, we usually use a standardized imaging data sets such as ADNI, DIAM, PPMI, etc. They provide up to thousands of images and millions of predictors. They are uh, longitudinal multicenter studies designed to develop clinical, imaging, genetic and biochemical biomarkers for the early detection and tracking of neurological diseases and conditions. However, uh, currently neuroimaging is not a big data problem. Uh, it is indeed a, a big problem. Uh, a contrast example is the ImageNet dataset, a typical big data set uh, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, field, that contains millions of training samples with thousands of predictors. That's why model-driven approaches in the field of neuroimaging were considered as suitable solutions, but of course, they are not the only one. Uh, Brayman said in the latter paper that if all a man has is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. So this is a, a phrase that is telling us that we should not use the same models always in any uh, uh, problem, uh, any uh, where every problem uh, cannot be solved with the same uh, um, uh, tools or techniques. So uh, this is what uh, why we are we are trying to change the paradigm to solve the neuroimaging uh, analysis uh, problem. Moreover, the advent of new technologies and modalities which provide more complex data is inviting us to, to try to, to use uh, uh, machine learning approaches instead of classical statistics. In this novel scenario, classical methods are not sufficiently accurate and even impractical because they cannot be computed efficiently. Bremen said as well that the trick to be a, a good scientist is to be open to using a wide variety of tools and that's why we are trying the application of machine learning in, in neuroscience in general. Well, let's start with the theory. Uh, the GLM, the general linear model, is defined as a simple equation, equation one, in which we relate uh, uh, the observation, the vector of observations with experimental conditions defined in the design matrix X and uh, the goal is to evaluate, to estimate theta. Theta is a, is a set of parameters that better explains why. Epsilon is assumed to be Gaussian distribute. Theta is usually estimated by a maximum likelihood criterion based on the Gaussianity assumption and is given classically by this equation too. Inferences of this model can be obtained using a linear compound specified by a contract weight vector C and writing a T statistics a statistic as equation 3. Well, the vector C selects some of the components in theta for comparison purposes. In fact, the SPMs, the statistical parametric map, maps, are derived from the assessment of T at different voxel or brain locations. As an example, assume that we get uh, only one level analysis in diagnostics and uh, this, is, this means that we got, uh, for example, a structural MRI acquisition, one per subject, and we try to access, assess the random effects across the population at each voxel. So we set up a GLM for the N observations across subjects to make inferences about the population. Here in this uh, figure, you can see two colors. The two colors uh, uh, stands for the two conditions that we are uh, assessing. This is the, the design matrix. The design matrix is very simple. Uh, and, and the ones indicate that uh, this object belongs to one, one condition. And we have to estimate theta that contains two, two, only, uh, two parameters by this maximum likelihood uh, criterion and make some inference how, about how large it is upon its covariance. Uh, 
if we continue with the sample, the best set of parameters in theta explain the observation is in y, as I said before. And uh, for example, if we select uh, the linear compound uh, 1 minus, minus 1, we are assessing how large is the first parameter theta 1 with respect to the, two par the second parameter theta 2. So the difference or contrast theta 1 minus theta 2 is uh, large or small. If it, if it is very large, then it, uh, T suggests a small probability, so the effect is significant. The latter sample is within the general framework of the ubiquitous SPM software. Uh, this uh, diagram uh, summarizes the, the, this framework, uh, contains three stages. The first stage is uh, pre-processing of fMRI, MRI, PET, whatever imaging technology. The second stage is uh, the, the, the stage in which we, we design, we propose the same matrix, uh, complex uh, experimental conditions and covariates. We include covariates, new sign variables, etc. And we uh, fit the general linear model. Then in the last part of the, of the framework, of the, of the pipeline, we uh, compute, we assess the statistical parametric maps. So we, found, we find uh, the regions that are uh, relevant in, in the group analysis. Well, uh, now it's time to answer the main question of the presentation. What is the connection between the GLM this GLM and the, and the, and the inference uh, based on, on the GLM and the machine learning and how we perform a statistical inference by machine learning. Well, uh, the GLM can be interpreted as the inverse problem or regressing the observation onto the conditions. So if you compare equation four with equation one, we can see that the variables are uh, in, the, in, the, in the opposite uh, side of, uh, of the equation. So now we are given the observations, we want to explain the experimental conditions um, by a set of uh, parameters omega that best explain the design matrix given the, the observations. So this is clearly a pattern classification problem that can be solved by machine learning. Indeed, we can, we can give a little proof uh, uh, to uh, demonstrate the connection using matrix algebra. We can really see that the equation 4 is equivalent to this equation 5, where we have uh, uh, leave uh, y on the right hand side of the equation uh, alone. And uh, we assume that the inverse of the norm, this term, is a 6, so it's not, uh, the norm is not 0. After some manipulations, we finally get this novel equation, where we define tilde, tilde theta and epsilon uh, tilde epsilon as the new uh, parameters theta and epsilon uh, related to the ones uh, that uh, we, uh, we find we, ha we have in the G general linear model. Therefore, solving this multiple regression problem is equivalent to estimating the parameters of the GLM. More details about these uh, connections can be found in the reference at the bottom of the slide. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, to sum up, in a, in a pattern classification problem, we usually assume the system of classes, this is the alternative hypothesis, that can be differentiated by classifiers with the performance measure in terms of accuracy, the concept of prevalence. Then we accept improperly, in a statistical sense, the alternative hypothesis using empirical confidence intervals. So, if we, in a classification, if we have two groups and, and we obtain a high uh, accuracy, we say that uh, the, the groups are uh, really different. Huh? So, uh, in, uh, up to date, uh, we apply machine learning uh, uh, in your imaging and we replace the SPM maps by, by some kind of spatial discriminant maps based on prevalence on some other specific feature Extracted at the training stage, for example, the distance to the separating hyperplane. In this work, uh, we extend this framework to pattern re regression and connect the machine learning parameters with the classical framework using the previous equation 7. 
The estimation is going to be performed by support vector regression. This is done by minimizing the sum of the empirical risk and a complexity term proportional to its norm, uh, where we employ the length one norm. And this minimization can be transformed into a uniquely solvable quadratic programming problem that provides the, the vector of parameters omega and the bias term b. Well, uh, let me go into some more detail about the connection. Uh, for simplicity, we are going to restrict the discussion to a special case of having two explanatory variables only, m, m is equal to 2. So, in this case, the equation 1 reads uh, as shown in the equation 10. We have only two parameters to be determined. If we uh, make some trick, we play some trick and, and we can, we can uh, transform equation 10 in a, in, a, in a model with just one parameter by applying this uh, matrix P. So we can transform 10 into 11 uh, where we only have to determine one parameter that is the contrast, theta 1 minus theta 2. Now let us consider the inverse model. The inverse model is the, the model where the, the, the explanatory matrix is on, on the, on the left-hand side of the equation. So if we try to connect this equation with the previous, we, uh, we are trying to obtain a set of parameters omega, in this case just one parameter, that better explain uh, the, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the column of the, of the, of the design matrix. Uh, center the same matrix so we can use the m the minimum square error solution the l length 2 norm solution that consists of minimizing the euclidean norm of the vector of error epsilon hat okay so simple calculus shows that the minimum is attained at this quantity in equation 14 and now by substituting equation 11 in 14, we also get the solution, the minimum square solution for the parameter omega uh, given in equation 15. Uh, observe how if the, the variance of the noise is small, tends to zero, then MSC regression estimate the parameters of the GLM, the, the optimal parameter. The optimal parameters is one over theta 1 minus theta 2. Okay, if we substitute the, uh, the length 2 norm by the length 1 norm, we have a different approach to solve the same problem. As E is given in 11, epsilon hat can be recast as epsilon, uh, uh, sorry, epsilon uh, arrow can be recast as epsilon hat in this way. And uh, where V is uh, the contrast uh, multiplied by, by omega. So assuming each component of epsilon hat comes from a PDF mixture of Gaussians, it can be uh, demonstrated easily, uh, then the law of large numbers uh, uh, give us a way to approximate the, the, this minimization, the minimization in equation 16, by minimizing uh, the expected value of, uh, of uh, epsilon hat. Some calculus uh, gives uh, the following step on the right hand side of equation uh, 18 and uh, by taking the gradient in the latter equation, taking the gradient here with respect to the omega and equating to zero, we get this equation. This equation of course cannot be solved analytically, but if we use the first of the Maglaurin series expansion of this equation, we finally get this equation and solving for omega we get the same uh, uh, solution as the one obtained uh, by the MSC uh, solution. Well it's time to run some experiments to evaluate to experimentally evaluate the performance of the above mentioned norms. In this figure we represent the estimation error obtained by using both criteria as a function of w, omega, and for different values of the standard deviation of the noise. Each curve is the average of 100 independent experiments, and it can be seen that both criteria are equivalent for low noise levels in the bottom part of the figure. 
However, the L1 norm based approach is more robust when the noise increases. We see that the red carp is below the blue carp. Well, uh, to sum up, uh, uh, to conclude the methodological section, we uh, now summarize uh, the most common machine learning based methods for statistical inference so far and we define, we will define the proposed one. Previous approaches were based on the on a T statistic on the vector of parameters omega, derived from simple class binary classifications. Or other approaches are based on the concept of prevalence or, or, or accuracy, writing the model error in cross-validation, the so-called operation tests, as the difference between the desired uh, response and the model approximation. We then propose a TS statistic using the, all the uh, methods and, and ideas uh, previously presented in this uh, presentation, including covariates and noise variables as the support vector regression inverse GLM in this way, in equation 21. So, uh, in the experimental part and with the aim of modeling different scenarios in fMRI time series analysis or structural MRI, etc. We simulate one dimensional observation vector uh, with different CNRs and sample sizes. Sample sizes refers to time points, subjects, etc. X, the design matrix, is going to be selected as, a, as the canonical uh, hemodynamic response function convolved by SCAR function with an exponential decay function that models habituation process in fMRI uh, task analysis or a, a covariate. We added a Gaussian noise vector with control variance, so we are under the Gaussian assumption, and we regress both explanatory variables and observations to obtain the experimental parameters for each domain, theta and omega. In this figure, I show you the simulated data that we are using in this, uh, in this part of the experiments. It is more than realistic. You, you can see in the in the in the top of the figure, the observations are very noisy, and uh, in the bottom of the figure, we see the two experimental conditions and the covariate, uh, the noisome variable uh, that is included in the design matrix. In in this uh, slide on the left, we show all the estimations that were employed to calculate the regressed observed variables given the explanatory matrix and the semantic parameters. On the right, we see how only for extremely noisy observations, CNR less than, than 0 0.5, and considerably high sample sizes, how did the uh, restricted maximum likelihood uh, uh, approach outperform the machine learning approaches in mean square error, even under the Gaussian assumption. On the right, uh, in, in this uh, figure, we show a permutation analysis. The p-value of the estimated contrast was less than 0 0.05 for all the methods, and the probability of observation was uh, selected as uh, 1 over 1001, so we generate 1000 uh, random permutations. And this uh, probability in all the cases uh, was uh, one, 1 over 1001 1, in all the cases when testing the null hypothesis. So, I mean, uh, if I rephrase, <laughs> I mean that uh, no false positive were detected during the simulated task. So, all the methods are very conservative. Anyway, the support vector regression in, uh, in the shape plot in green uh, provided result closest to the nominal false positive rate, whilst the remainder were over conservative. In this part, we use a real structural MRI dataset. We use the Edmund dataset we, we, that contains in our, in our collection uh, more than 200 normal controls and around 200 uh, Alzheimer's disease subjects. These subjects are advanced Alzheimer's disease subjects. We also include the, the most important covariates, the most common set 
or chlorates used in the stand literature, for example, H, sex, and ICV. We show in this part the inference that derived from the two methodologies in each domain, so the SPM and the support vector regression. We constructed a specially standard statistical process, processes uh, generating maps of significance using uh, gray matter volumes, and we compare the SPM, uh, um, uh, the univariate SPM, where significance is first individually assessed at each voxel and then on cluster with a P family wise error correction based on random field theory. We perform mainly two analyses. Hippocampal analysis to assess the statistical power, assuming that the hippocampus is a, is a positive region in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, an another analysis, uh, the type 1 error control, in a putatively new uh, cerebellar region, assuming that the cerebellum is a, is a negative region in Alzheimer's disease. In this uh, figure, we really see uh, the higher statistical power of uh, machine learning methods, methods uh, and the strong dependence uh, of the standard SPN on the sample size. We see on the, on the, on the left, uh, in the bottom figure, how the number of true positive in SPN increases with sample size. This is, a, uh, this is not a very good uh, um, uh, situation. And uh, we see how the number of true positive in the machine learning approaches are almost constant. On the, on the right, we show the T statistics, uh, normalized, con the normalized contrast. And we see how the variability in the positive regions is higher in the machine learning approach versus the standard, the raw SPM. On the contrary, in, in this figure, we illustrate the over-conservative voxel-wide inference with family-wise error correction or based on random field theory. Although the proportion methods uh, 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 based on machine learning provided a significant number of tests closer to the expected value, around 0 0.05. So when we analyze the zero volume, uh, a negative region, we obtain in both in all cases uh, a conservative uh, uh, a conservative uh, uh, behavior of the of the methods, but machine learning provides a higher number of 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 uh, of, um, of um, tests uh, with uh, with a uh, with an expected value, so closer to the to the false positive. I mean, uh, refreshing the the previous uh, sentence. Well, uh, in this slide, we apply uh, the same analysis to the whole volume. As you can see in the bottom, uh, in the bottom figure, uh, the, machine, the maximum likelihood approach implementing SPM finds very few significant relationships between the covariate effects and the observations. This is a this is a, this is a surprisingly uh, an, an issue because uh, 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 it is already known that uh, this uh, uh, covariate affect the observation. So should be uh, we should find uh, a, a connection uh, among them. Well, uh, this uh, these uh, relationships are greater when we, uh, we use the support vector regression approach uh, that gels stronger connection, of course, mainly uh, for the sex covariate. You can see in the, in the top figure, uh, in the sex covariate, how the figure is, uh, is, uh, tends to, to a white color. Well, uh, the, the, the analysis using random field theory provides us a, a vessel to obtain uh, activation maps. So, uh, if we select the aforementioned uh, target regions and plot the T-score histograms, we can approximately compute an optimum vessel based on the Neiman Pearson lemma, assuming that both regions are negative and positive. So. If we compare with the later value, uh, with the one we used uh, in previous sections, 
we can really see the overconservative nature of a standard Bosset Wise inference uh, comparing with this uh, Neiman Pearson uh, value. If we extend the, 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 well, this threshold to the whole volume, we can obtain uh, the novel activation maps for the SVR and uh, the standard SPM. And we can see how the number of voxels detected uh, by the SVR approach uh, is higher than the ones obtained by the SPM approaches. So we are concluding. Uh, there's a, an increasing trend to incorporate exploratory methods into well-established GLMM-based data analysis. Uh, we present a novel univariate methodology for um, fMRI image analysis, structural, any uh, modality. We can uh, we can uh, we can analyze uh, we can analyze analyze it with a uh, with a proposed methodology. It proposes a complete voice wide inference uh, and process all the covariates at once. This is the main finding of our method that combines the effect of all the covariates when estimating the observation or response variable. This all this work result in a in a conventional statistical inference based on the optimal estimation derived from machine learning with limited amounts of data. In the future, uh, we will extend our analysis to a multivariate scenario, multivariate pattern analysis. We will apply the proposed method to existing data sets that were analyzed in the past and they overlook the effect of covariates and we extend, in, in a theoretical sense, we will extend our analysis to the general case of uh, M greater than 2. So, uh, thank you for your attention. It's been my great pleasure to, to share these slides with you. I hope to see you in the future. Bye.